Members in the chamber will then vote electronically, selecting for, against, or abstain, and the results will be displayed. Since it's impractical to stand or speak when our microphone Can you hear? No, I think it's the, it's just coming in and out. I think you can hear me again now. Since it's impractical to stand to speak when our microphones are on the tables, I propose that standing order 21.2. On again, oh, back again. For that motion, um, can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Smith, thank you very much. So, um, does anybody wish to vote against that motion? Uh, anybody wishing to abstain? That's good. Okay. So, in that case, um, I'll um, take that by affirmation. So, that means we can remain seated while we're using the microphones. And officers have confirmed that the meeting is court and we can proceed. Thank you. So, firstly, item one, apologies. Um, we are, sorry. Uh, members, I've been advised by our IT specialist that the, I, the live stream is having problems. Can we just pause for a moment while we just make sure that that's working? Um, if anybody, if the um, officers alert us that there's a problem, I will pause the meeting again. So, firstly, um, apologies, and uh, Rebecca Dobson, would you be kind enough to give, let us know if there are any apologies for absence? Yes, thank you, Chair. Apologies for absence have been received from Councillors Clayton, Bear Park, Bygot, Chum Johnson, Percival, Mason, Betson, and Howell. And I understand that participating remotely, we have councillors Daunton, Hunt, McDonald. And one more point to note, Chair, is that councillor Khan will attend a little later as he had an unavoidable commitment. So he will join in an hour and a half approximately. Thank you. Thank you. And I understand councillor Sarah Chung Johnson is unable to attend. Is that correct? Chair, I mentioned Councillor oh, Johnson as well. Sorry, thank 
Councillor Heatherwood. Um, yes, just oh. Councillor Mark Howe is attending virtually. So. Thank you. Just one moment, members. I've got a really unusual and message on my microphone. Chair. Just one moment. Just one moment. I think it's okay. I'm sorry, Councillor Williams. I didn't hear because I, something strange came up on my microphone. Could you repeat what you said? Just to say that um, Councillor Howell is uh, uh, virtual, not apologies. As you can see, his face shining down okay. at us. So, Councillor Howell. So we've got Councillor Howell taking part remotely. Lovely to see you, Councillor Howell. Are there any other members taking part remotely who would like to make themselves known if we haven't mentioned? Councillor Nick Wright, I can see you're there as well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I am attending, yes. That's good. And Councillor Nick Sample taking part remotely? Yes, hello. Hi. Quite splendid. Thank you very much. There's a whole panoply of other names um, on the side there. But these are officers. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. So, members, declarations of interest. Uh, do any members have any interest to declare in relation to any items of business on the agenda? Um, Councillor Nick Wright, did you want to speak? You're muted. Uh, good. We can hear you now. Thank you. Um, yes, I do. I have an item 14B, which I have a pecuniary interest in that motion. I'm uh, expecting at some point some of the land with dead trees on it to be returned to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Wright. Uh, any other interests? Yes, I can see um, Councillor Eileen Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Um, in relation to item 13E, I would like to declare a non-pecuniary interest in that I'm a trustee of the Fenedge Community Association. Thank you very much. And Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm a member of the Greater Cambridge Partnership Assembly. Thank you very much. If any other interest... And, and oh, Chair, sorry. sorry. Henry Batchelor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, item 17, I have a potential conflict, so under advice, I won't be taking any part in that item. Which item was that, sorry? 17. 17, the thank you very much. Part. And I can see that Councillor Peter MacDonald would like to... Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, so, a little bit like Councillor Heather Williams, I declare an interest as substitute member for the GCP board. Thank you very much. Uh, if, as we arrive at these items... OK, sorry. Um, we'll take those at the time. But Councillor Neil Goff. Yes, um, with respect to question 13E, uh, as Councillor Wilson said, I am a trustee of the same organisation, the Fenedge Community Association, which is on my de declaration of interest. Thank you, Councillor Goff. Perhaps you'd move your microphone more in line so that when you speak, we can hear you better. Thank you. Was there, was there another one that I didn't see? Councillor Wilson. Oh, Councillor Wilson. You're very interesting. <laughs> um, I, I declare that I... To am a member of the Greater Cambridge Partnership Joint Assembly. Thank you. And Councillor Mills. <laughs> Thank you. While we're playing the game, I'm also on the Greater Cambridge Partnership Assembly. Assembly. Thank you very much. Right. Have we got these interests all sorted out? Lovely. However, if anybody realises at the point in the agenda that they have an interest, do declare it at the time. Please could we um, proceed on to... The register of interests, as ever, members are reminded of the need to keep their register of interests up to date and to inform democratic services of any changes. So, moving on to the minutes, which are on page one of our agenda. Um, uh, I just wanted to draw members' attention to the fact that a further supplement has been issued in respect of this item, uh, which members, uh, there are copies in the democratic services area, but I'll hand over to Rebecca Dobson to explain. Thank you, Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so just to ensure all members present are aware that there has been a supplementary pack for this item, the minutes of the previous meeting issued today, and that due to the short notice, paper copies are present so that you can refer to them. The um, minutes that were included in the pack were a previous version, and this is the correct version as published on the page on the website for the meeting on 22nd of February. 
Thank you, Mr. Dobson. So, um, just to clarify, then, the minutes that were published on the website were correct. The minutes that were included in our agenda pack were not correct, but you've been given a supplement uh, which is correct. So, um, do any members have any items to raise on the minutes? Actually, I'm going to start off with that because I had a few, so I'll do mine first, just to get them out of the way. I have already informed um, Rebecca Dobson of these. So, on our page five, um, under item 8A, about four lines down, we're talking about the minimum wage, but it's been typed as W-A-T-E. Uh, the council had a minimum wage of £10 for its employees. The second one um, was that at item 11 on our page 19, um, it was myself, the chair, who proposed the calendar of meetings under item 11. And I think that was it. I think that was it. And I suspect some of these things will have been corrected in the minutes that we now have as a supplement. Did anybody have any other items they wish to raise on the minutes? Councillor Malia. Um, yeah, just to say that I believe I did send my apologies for the last meeting. It's not recorded, but maybe on the... I haven't seen the supplement, but... Okay, uh, I'll just have a look. No, we can add you to the um, apologies. Let me just see if you're... No, you're not down there as either present or having given apologies, so we can add you as having given apologies. Any other items, members, on those? Yeah, I haven't thing. seen the corrected version, so I don't know whether it's been noted, but uh, it was cancelled. Okay. I don't know whether it's been noted, Chair, but it was Councillor Rippett who was in the Vice Chair because I was um, not present. I was participating from yes. the, the The corrected minutes do record that correctly, that it was Councillor Judith Rippett who was acting as Vice Chair that day. Thank you. Right. So, members, are you happy that we approve those minutes? Thank you very much indeed. That's helpful. Does anybody wish to object or abstain? No. Thank you. So, um, by affirmation, the Council therefore agrees the approval of the minutes of the 22nd of February 2022 as amended as a correct record. Um, so, announcements. Just I'd like to make an announcement, and that is I wanted to thank members and members of staff uh, for their generosity to the Chair's Benevolent Fund, uh, which this year, uh, firstly raised a total of £712.50 for Fullbourne Hospital, and uh, my assistant, Glenda Hanson, kindly used £233 odd of this to purchase presents for uh, the Fullbourne Hospital um, gifting at Christmas, and uh, also a balance of £478 was donated to the Friends of Fullbourne Hospital after Christmas. Uh, and the balance remaining in the fund, which um, I look forward to donating to Centre 33, is £1,016 and one penny. So thank you very much for your generosity. But of course, members, you're still welcome to make donations to the Chair's Benevolent Fund, which we would very much welcome. Thank you. Um, yes, the next uh, person is the leader. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I actually have three announcements. Sorry, you thought I only had one. Um, I'll take by surprise. So the first one's uh, quite simple. Uh, it's announcing the change of date of the September cabinet meeting, which was set on the, for the 26th of September and is going to be moved to the 12th of September. The second one is the, uh, I would just like to announce the success of the council in the IESE awards where they won silver medal in the Public Sector Transformation Awards. So this is, this is an award to the whole council because all of the Green to Our Core initiatives 
which uh, you know, are not with one department. They go through every single uh, area of the council. They all contributed to this and huge contributions from members as well. So I think we should all be rightly very, very proud of this. And I'm going to put it in front of me so it looks as if I'm taking all the credit for it. And then um, lastly, this is the last full council meeting of this civic year and the last full council meeting of the four-year term for which most of us were elected. So I would just like to express my very sincere thanks to all members for your contributions to the operation of this council, to the success of this council, but even more importantly, for your contributions to supporting your residents at what must have been the most difficult four-year term of any council since the Second World War, really. You know, it has been desperate, and we have all risen to the challenge, very, very ably supported by our, our councillors. So, you know, my thanks to all of you, and I wish you all, you know, very, I wish you all well in the coming May elections. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any, uh, no, no, nothing from um, the head of paid service. Thank you. So, members, um, okay, and Um, so, we move on to questions from the public, please. Um, there is one public statement uh, from Mr. Brian Williams of Waterbeach. Um, but with your permission, um, Brian, I'm going to ask you if you would be happy to speak when we consider the item about which your statement is about, which is the Waterbeach Neighbourhood Plan at item 9. I hope that's acceptable to you, Mr. Williams. Yes, uh, I was expecting that, uh, Chair. Lovely. Okay, then. Thank you very much. Item seven is petitions, and no petitions have been received for consideration at this meeting. So, item 8A is the member parental leave policy, which was a recommendation of Cabinet on the 22nd of March 2022. And this is on pages 29 to 48 of our agenda. Um, may I call on Councillor John Williams, Lead Cabinet Member for Finance, to move the recommendation, please. Thank you, Chair. I uh, move the recommendation on paragraph three on page 29 of our agenda pack. Um, I'm very proud to, um, to move this recommendation, and I hope it's not going to be controversial. Um, the details um, are in paragraph 5 on page 30. And what it does, it brings in line uh, members in line with um, the equal pay um, and parental leave policy that we have um, for our officers. And as you see, um, it enables um, members, councillors, the right to take extended leave from their normal duties for the reasons of maternity, paternity, adoption, or shared parental leave, um, instead of having the discretion uh, of, of, the, uh, of, of the leader of the council uh, in this matter. I believe that you know, our members, our councillors, should have those rights, as our officers do, and I'm very proud that we are one of 40 councils that have now adopted, or hopefully will adopt this policy, and that um, I, I would like to see many more councils adopt this policy to ensure that councillors are treated as fairly as officers in with, with regard to this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor John Williams. Do you have a seconder for this? Uh, I am happy to second it. <laughs> if you do not have an alternative. No, I thought it was your chair. Lovely, thank you very much. Okay, so I'm happy to second. So we're open to, for debate. Councillor Roberts, I can see you. Um, thank you, Chairman. I think it's particularly contentious. I, I, I do think that there's a major difference between um, officers and members. Uh, I don't agree that we're um, all of the same body and that all the rules should apply equally. Um, 
The thing that I don't like about it is the uh, allowing uh, members who aren't working, who have taken a life choice, because having uh, little monsters that many of us have had is something that we choose to do. Um, and if we choose to do that, um, I think it's entirely wrong that people can go off on leave. Um, people who are actually volunteers, not officers, not paid staff, can go off for six months or whatever, even more it seems, and be paid for it. Um, that's the part of it that I don't approve of, and, and therefore I won't be voting for it. Uh, because I, I don't actually imagine that um, it's going to be something that's going to um, be actually affecting that many members. I mean, well, I don't think I'm going to have another one. No, I don't think so. I'll have some more chickens. Um, but I don't actually believe it's going to be used a great deal. But those who use it, if they've chosen to do this, fine. Um, and if they want to still be a councillor, fine. But they shouldn't expect to be paid for time when they're not working. Uh, that's entirely inappropriate. It's the public who are paying them for doing nothing. Um, and uh, therefore, I won't be voting for it. Thank you very much. Would anybody else like to speak? Councillor Smith. Thank you very much. So I think this is a really good piece of, piece of work. Uh, the reality is for us as elected members that even when we're on holiday, we're actually still working. And I strongly suspect that even somebody who's on uh, parental leave will still be receiving emails and still be receiving phone calls and will still be hijacked in the co-op or the doctor's surgery by people looking to them to, uh, to help them. So what this is really about is the six-month ru month rule to ensure that people do not uh, lose their seats um, because they're on paternity leave and are actually not able to attend one of the statutory meetings because they are looking after a young child. So that's what this is about. So at the LGA, um, you know, we are very, very concerned about the lack of diversity and the poor age profile of councillors throughout the country. You know, being a councillor, I'm afraid, is largely the prerogative of retired fairly well-off men, I'm afraid, the middle, middle class, middle-aged men. And, you know, it's got to be addressed. There, people are leaving, sorry guys, <laughs> people are leaving um, public service in their droves, in particular young women, and in particular young women of colour. And this has to be reversed. And the only way we can do that is by having policies like this that make it as easy as possible for everybody to serve as a, as a councillor. We need to take away the barriers to serving and help them to do it. So I welcome this and I thank um, the officers who put con considerable effort into it. And, uh, and I'm very proud that we are going to join the 40 or so councils who've already got, got a parental leave policy. And I hope there will be hundreds more in the near future. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor um, Alex Mullion. Thank you, Chair. Um, as someone who has had a baby during my term as a councillor, so there, there are those amongst us who would um, have use of this policy, I'm, I'm really pleased that we are introducing this as a council and, um, and support that. I'd, I'd like to echo the thanks to the officers who've worked really hard on preparing this, particularly Jonathan Corbett and Thank you for speaking to, to myself and Councillor Cohn, who has also um, become a new parent during his term as a councillor, to, to, to learn from our experiences. So um, I'm, I was extremely well supported by my group, though as Bridget, uh, as Councillor Smith has said, I did have to continue to do some work and I was, I was actually called by a resident the night I brought my baby home from the hospital. So, um, but I, I think there is also a need to formalise the processes and to make sure that there is protection for us as, as members um, if we do become uh, parents during our, our term. Um, and I think, again, as Councillor Smith said, this sends a clear message that we support new parents, we understand the pressures they face, and also is incredibly important in, in ensuring that we encourage people of all ages and experience to become and to remain councillors, and particularly women. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Mallion. Uh, Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. 
Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I, I just want to add my thanks uh, to the officers that have helped put this together. Um, and in my role as the Equality and Diversity Champion, um, I am glad that this council has always taken this step, um, just building up on what Councillor Bridget Smith has said, we need um, to increase the diversity of the types of people um, who actually become uh, local councillors. Um, people like me are graying and getting old and probably going out, you know, I need young people to come in young black people, young Asian people, minority ethnics, um, because there are more of us here in South Cairns than is represented in this room, in this council. So thank you, I will be voting for this, and frankly, I am disappointed that someone says, it is a choice and they don't have to do this and that and the other, but never mind, it's what it is. I will be supporting it, so please do that, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hawkins. Councillor Judith Ripis. If I may, I'd like to read this statement out on behalf of Councillor Chin Johnson. Uh, she says, I'm very pleased we have a parental leave policy in place for councillors and would like to thank the leader and our chief executive for taking forward a suggestion myself and Councillor Malian made, and thanks also for the officers who worked on this policy. We should all be striving to make our council as diverse and representative of our community as possible. And this is a welcome step towards achieving this. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nigel Cathcart, did you wish to say something? It's just, um, you know, I, I fully endorse this policy. When I was elected as a council 32 years ago, it was full of <clears throat> the very sort of person that Bridget Smith has described, totally unrepresentative of the district, uh, often even unrepresentative of their own families. Um, and this is a very welcome step towards actually correcting that. Um, uh, and I think in those days, there was actually very little real debate. They all agreed amongst themselves. Um, and that is not a, not a brilliant idea. There's always scope for alternative points of view however uncomfortable they are. Um, and I think that you are going to get alternative points of view, which is fine uh, when you actually open it up more widely. So I, I would welcome this policy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Cass. Yes? When Nigel and I came on 32 years ago, actually, we were young and I had young children. So um, those who are sitting around thinking, well, look at that old video over there. I was young once and I had young children. I'm sure there's no... I'm sure there's no question that at some point in the past you were a young Met councillor. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Um, so, Councillor Heather Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so, I, I was on maternity leave when I joined the council. Um, and, uh, and I did a lot of the time around breastfeeding and others, particularly in a certain meeting when, to quote one of the colleagues, I'd sprung a leak. Um, and so, I think... Councillor Mallion will know what I'm thinking of there. Um, so I think there's a, there's a duty on all of us as well to be inclusive in people that want to continue um, and, and make sure that, you know, the facilities are there as well. And I, I do hope we won't lose that, that it's not a case that people... We want people to have choice. So, for example, myself, I, I wanted to do the, the job and, and carry on, and I didn't want to take any leave, but for others... Other people, they may want to make different choices. And so long as we're catering for both um, sets of, of councillors, then, you know, that's um, important. Um, I would say as well, there's, again, that responsibility on all of, all of us. I remember standing for election and an opposition candidate announcing my pregnancy on Twitter. That was a nice experience, not. Um, it's how my aunt found out. So... I think what I would ask people is, yes, I understand the merits of this um, and to take things forward, but I think we really, if we really want that spirit of inclusiveness, then we, we need to broaden our behaviours across the board as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Councillor Graham Cohn. 
Um, I, I think I'd be repeating a lot of what's been said, really. I support the policy. Um, I think it does give um, people choice and it clearly sets out, um, you know, what, you know, our policy is on the issue. So I'm happy to support it. Thank you, Councillor Cohn. And Councillor Steve Hunt online. Did you wish to speak? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I would like to. Um, I really support this and uh, casting my mind back to when I was considering standing for election with young children, but not as young as obviously you know, newborns, but it was a consideration. How much time is it going to take? And I think anybody who's younger than that and is considering standing would be uh, really, really, really welcome the knowledge that this was here so that should they uh, suddenly sort of uh, develop children, um, so to speak, they would have this facility. And I think that's great because uh, it's clearly important, as so many people agree, that we have great diversity and people from of all ages and all backgrounds and all walks of life find it uh, practical and comfortable to become a councillor. Thank you very much. And Councillor Bhattacharya? What about diversity? Did you actually say diversity? I mean, if you say diversity, I'm a good example of the diversity, uh, if you mean so. Because I work with diversity, inclusion, and equality, and in, and in last, the last four years, I have organized more than 350 events, activities, workshops, those are I mean, uh, those are actually covered by BBC, radio, TV, local newspaper, funders, magazine, everywhere. But I have never, I never got a chance to show off any of my work in your magazine. Not even a single paragraph was reflected. None of my work on diversity was, was reflected on That's your, on your esteem, esteem magazine. Sorry, so do you really work on is, your, is your point related to the parental leave policy? No, no. I just heard. I just heard someone. Someone is talking. Uh, someone is talking about diversity. Parental no, leave is one thing, but I just heard about diversity and inclusion. So I just came around that part. Are you really talking about diversity? No, we're talking about parental inclusion. Oh, when you talk about diversity, you you also have to mention that you are talking about diversity. And I am uh, and and. And, and here I am the I am the case of the diversity. I have run uh, I have run more than 350 to 400 events. Council not Bastaria. even a single Council not even, I did not get a single paragraph on this on this basis of the diversity. So please talk about something not about diversity. Sorry, Councillor Bhattacharya, what I was trying to ask you was sorry, I didn't mean to say we weren't talking about diversity because. The parental leave policy enab enables diversity in this council. I was trying to ask if you had a point about the parental leave policy, um, but thank you for your contribution. Uh, Councillor Daunton, Councillor Dr. Daunton. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I was one of the people who worked closely with Jonathan Corbett on this policy, and I do want to pay tribute to him, to the careful work that he's done in bringing this to us today. That's all I wanted to say, just to acknowledge the work of Jonathan and of Jeff Membry as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other people who wish to speak online, Councillor Fang? No, OK. So I'm seconding this. So I would just like to thank the work that's gone into this policy that brings our members in line with the um, staff policy. And uh, as Councillor Cathcart pointed out, it was a very different complexion of council when I first joined in 2014. And I'm very glad that we've seen a big change in um, the demographic of people who feel able to stand for election and, and to stand as councillors. So for me, this is about inclusion and making it possible for people to um, take part in the democratic process and take part in public life, knowing that should they become, have the happy event of becoming pregnant or becoming a potential father, uh, that there is a policy which enables them to um, be remunerated. So I have, I'm very happy to endorse this, um, this paper. So thank you very much. Members, are you content to take this decision 
by affirmation? Okay, no, okay. So, um, are there any others who wish to object? Uh, would you like to indicate if you wish to object? And any... Sorry, this is the vote, Councillor Roberts. Absolutely, we understand you. That is what you, the point you made at the time when you spoke. So, uh, are there any others other than Councillor Roberts who wish to object? No, and, and I can see that Councillor Khan has just joined us. Uh, thank you. Are there any others who wish to abstain? Thank you. So, with, that, with the exception of Councillor Roberts, would the other members uh, are happy to take that by affirmation? Thank you very much indeed. And, and I will just say, Councillor Bhattacharya, thank you for your contribution. And um, I do understand what you were saying, and I will listen to what you've said. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, thank you. Water Beach Neighbourhood Plan is the next item on the agenda. And I will ask uh, Brian Williams to speak, who is the chair of the Water Beach Neighbourhood Plan steering group. Uh, so, Councillor Brian Williams, do go ahead. You have three minutes to speak. Sorry, Chair, just a bit of trouble unmuting there. Okay. Um, just like to say a thank you, Chair and Council, for allowing me to speak at what to the people of Water Beach is a momentous occasion as you make, hopefully, the Water Beach Neighbourhood Plan. It was seven years ago that uh, South Cams agreed that Water Beach should develop a neighbourhood plan that would reflect the wishes of people living within the boundaries of the parish. Those seven years have were spent in producing several iterations of the plan, each reflecting the views of Water Beach people, community groups and businesses. Evidence for the plan was gathered using drop-in sessions in community rooms and even on uh, stalls at the Water Beach Feast. Questionnaires were deployed online and in paper form so that we could gather the widest views and fed back through collection boxes in shops and community groups. The consideration of the evidence collected led to the plan being developed as a document, which was then tested and amended through the formal consultations in the neighbourhood plan process. This included the whole of the South Cam's statutory consultee list, which was, I think, about 1,500 or so long. Uh, so it can be seen that we consulted on a wide range of views and diverse interests. Plan was reviewed against comments at each consultation and amended accordingly. A submission version was then produced and assessed by an independent inspector to ensure planning policies such as MPPF and the South Cam's local plan were properly respected, recommending changes to make it so. I'd therefore like to thank Alison Talkington and her team for the work they put in to assist in applying the inspector's suggestions to the neighbourhood plan and getting it to a point where it could be presented to the people in the form of a referendum. This turned out a positive result on the 3rd of March, 2022. We now entrust our neighbourhood plan to you all in the hope it will be made and be used as the basis for all Water Beach planning decisions as the view of every Water Beach resident without having to wait for the comments to come in. Finally, for other villages wishing to prepare a neighbourhood plan, it is hard but worthwhile. But don't be afraid, but do get help. Our planning advisor, Rachel Hogger from Cambridge Acre, has been invaluable, embedding herself into the team and ensuring we properly applied the policies. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Williams. Uh, and I know how much hard work you've put into it. So thank you very much for your contribution to to the neighbourhood plan. Um, so now may I call on the lead cabinet member for planning and development to propose the recommendation and respond. Thank Sorry. you very much, Chair. Too many things. <laughs> uh, here in South Cams, we have, as of today, uh, made four neighbourhood plans. And I said made because that's a techie term for adopting. Um, we had Great Abingdon in February 2019, Cottenham 
and Histon and Impington in May 2021, and Foxton in August of 2021, which makes up the four. We had designated 18 other neighborhood areas, and um, those are preparing their plans. But today, as you've heard, we have the pleasure of bringing to this council one of those 18 to make it, and that is Water Beach. Um, thank you to uh, Brown Williams for his um, uh, introduction as the chair of the Water Beach uh, Neighborhood Planning Group. He's told you about the journey they've uh, been on getting to this stage. So I want to thank him and the members of the <coughs> Neighborhood Planning Group uh, for all the work they've done. And of course, a big thank you to Alison Tolkington, who is our uh, officer expert on neighborhood plans for her continued dedication and work in actually assisting our communities um, to develop their neighborhood plans. Now, South Camps designated uh, Water Beach on 10th of August, uh, 2015. And of course, following all the work uh, that you've heard about, it came back to uh, this council in February of 2020 for the formal adoption process to start. Um, you will see from the report uh, of the plan that the referendum that took place on 22nd of March, um, that 89.9% of those who participated voted in favor of it, which is a, a good number. And having gone through the plan myself, I'm quite impressed with the way in which it has been set out and the contents. Um, it is a plan that covers the proposed development and use of land in Water Beach Parish up to 2031. I'd like to draw your attention actually um, to the plan vision as it was stated in page 94 of our papers. Um, it has seven themes, 10 objectives that underpin that vision. And the plan very helpfully for those readings identifies the South Cam's local plan policies that are relevant to the community, including, of course, SS Stroke 6, which is the Water Beach New Town, and of course, how that links to their key issues, number five and number six. Um, of course, some of the other themes and objectives cover biodiversity, design principles, landscape, etc. I also particularly like the way in which the 24 planning policies have been drawn up and a subset attached. Members, would you do other members the courtesy of being quite Point of information, Chair, you didn't do anything when the lead member of planning was laughing at a member of my group for being upset on an issue. Sorry, I didn't see that. I apologise, but I did hear this. Let's proceed. Thank you, Chair. And as I said, the way in which the 24 planning policies have been drawn up and set to each of their objectives shows the thoughtfulness that has gone into this work. And you can have a look at that on pages 195 to 197 of our papers. Now, neighborhood plans once made become part of our adopted local plan policies and carry planning weight. And um, I'm hoping that no doubt this one will um, help our development teams as they work in future with Water Beach Parish Council to use this neighborhood plan as a material consideration for applications that come forward in Water Beach. So, Chair, I heartily uh, move the recommendations in paragraphs 4A and 4B on page 49 of our agenda papers and ask members present to please fully support the making today of the Water Beach neighborhood plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins. Uh, I plan to second this um, motion and our, or this making of the plan, and I'll reserve my right to speak to the end. The debate is open now, and uh, the first person who I would like to call to speak is uh, Councillor Judith Ripeth, who has a statement to read, um, which has been written by uh, Councillor Paul Bearpark. The local one of the local members who's not able to be present. So, Councillor Judith Ripith, do carry on. Thank you. The Water Beach Neighbourhood Plan has been in the making for the past seven years. Those of us who have been working on it greeted the referendum result with a mixture of relief and delight. 
is an important milestone for Water Beach. The views of Water Beach residents will now have a greater role in guiding the development of Water Beach, both new town and village, going forwards. Developing a neighbourhood plan is a significant undertaking for volunteers with no experience of the development of planning policy and little knowledge of the planning process. We were fortunate to be guided by Rachel Hogger during the consultations on the development of policies and in our response to the consultations and the examiner. During the development of the Water Beach Neighbourhood Plan, there was a feeling that we were continually chasing our tails. We had to ensure that we were reflecting all the decisions and new policies relating to Waterbeach Newtown as they arose. The Urban and Civic and Royal London Waterbeach outline planning applications were brought forward. The new town supplementary planning document was consulted on and published. RLW applied to move the station and the Greater Cambridge Partnerships Waterbeach to Tra Cambridge Transport and greenway schemes were initiated. All of these had to be reflected in the neighbourhood plan. I'd like to thank the following for their dedication to seeing the neighbourhood plan, plan through to completion. Parish councillors Brian Williams, Jane Williams and Jane Williamson have all been involved throughout the process. Brian led the steering group, keeping up the momentum during the ups and downs. Jane Williams kept the community engaged right up until the referendum when she tried to encourage residents to vote by explaining what they were voting for. Jane Williamson's deep local knowledge of Water Beach's history and heritage was invaluable throughout for informing our work. Finally, I would like to thank Belinda Westwood who provided the group with tireless admin support for the last few years and of course, Alison Talkington and the team at South Cairns. And if I may, Chair, I'd like to add one or two of comments on my own. Yes, do. So thank you to everyone who has been involved with this extremely important piece of work. Of course, Councillor Paul Bear Park, in his characteristically modest way, hasn't really mentioned his role in this um, work too. So I wanted also, so. Apologies. So I would also like to extend my thanks to him. This is a really important day. So, yes, please vote for this. Thank you very much. And I can see we have Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, so many of us at some point or other have sat on planning committee and we have seen the incredible amount of work that Water Beach Parish Council put into their applications when they're coming through. And I think that the level of work and commitment that they've made is reflected in this, in this neighbourhood plan as well. Um, and uh, I think they should all be congratulated for any part that they've played, small or, or big. You know, it all adds up in the end. Um, and uh, definitely, we're uh, not in the habit of trying to overturn referendums, Chair, so you'll have our support today. That's great. Thank you very much. Councillor Bridget Smith. Uh, thank you very much. So over the last few years, I've um, had the privilege of reading a number of uh, neighbourhood plans. This one's outstanding. It really, really is. And I think that's reflected in the, uh, the, the huge support it got at referendum. So I think it's an outstanding piece of work. So I think not only do the working group deserve our congratulations, actually, they deserve a medal, quite honestly, because I think this has, this has raised the bar. And I'm very, very impressed with it. And uh, yeah, I've been involved in one myself. I think I'm up to um, five years now, so obviously there's a way to go to, uh, to beat them at seven. But my congratulations to them, and I do hope we can all support this. Thank you. Councillor Nigel Cathcart. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I think this is an excellent piece of work. It's extremely detailed, um, and also this, these neighbourhood plans are a very useful way of local communities understanding their villages, looking at what is there, assessing what's important, trying to determine exactly how to deal with it. So it's not a one-off document, it's a working document, something to be kept by your side for many years to come to guide uh, future parish councillors and community leaders on how to develop the, vi uh, the, the village. So these documents are incredibly important going into the future, not just at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Henry Batchelor. 
Thank you, Chair. I think, as Councillor Hawkins mentioned at the start, the first neighbourhood plan that was made was that of Great Abington, of which I'm one of the local members. And in their neighbourhood plan, they have one policy. And even that took several, several years to, from beginning to, to fruition and adoption. So a place the size of Water Beach, I can't even fathom how much work and patience was put in by those that were involved in it. So I fully commend them for the amount of work they put in. And I, for one, will certainly be supporting this, Chair. Thank you very much. I can't see any other speakers, so I'm going to follow up uh, as seconder. Um, I remember way back when the um, neighbourhood plan team first started to think about the neighbourhood plan, and I remember um, the enthusiasm, but the huge work that um, the group took on because they decided right from the outset they wanted to include um, the area that was going to be developed into Water Beach Newtown. Um, it wasn't just the village they were concerned about, it was the whole area. And um, I was so impressed with the way people engaged with that. Uh, and I particularly wanted to thank um, this, the group at Water Beach for keeping your residents in Water Beach engaged with the process. And I've seen that both at the Water Beach Community Forum where you've um, taken opportunities to bring the matters to the attention of the public and answering questions um, and gathering of views. And I, I, I think there's this extraordinary process of bringing up a whole set of ideas and then gathering those views in and then making them into a sensible uh, train of thread and thought. Uh, and I, I'm just very impressed with the quality of the work that has gone into this plan. So I just wanted to thank everybody involved uh, in, in my own ward for, for what you have done. Uh, and I would heartily recommend this to the council. So thank you very much. There are no other speakers. So um, can, I just, can I suggest that, um, uh, are you content to take this matter by affirmation? Agreed. Anybody wish to abstain or object? No. So, great. The Council therefore agrees this motion by affirmation. Uh, but um, a recorded vote is needed. So, um, can I ask the webcasting officer to conduct an electronic vote? Uh, oh, sorry. I've just said or. <laughs> do, do we take it by affirmation? Sorry. Forgive me. Rory, do we need a vote? Or? Yeah, we're doing it. Lovely. So, please press the blue button to indicate your presence. And then green if you agree. Red if you object and yellow if you abstain. Okay, so we're 30 in the room. Okay. Yes, I think we're 30 in the room. Um, and we're 30 voted. So thank you very much indeed, members. Uh, that's carried by, carried by, carried. So moving on to item uh, 10. This is the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Combined Authority uh, report. Um, and members, I invite the council to note the reports on the work of the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Combined Authority as outlined in the circulated papers and ask the Council's representatives on the Combined Authority to comment if they wish to do so. So, members, are there any comments? We have um, members on the board, on the Overview and Scrutiny Committee, and on the Audit and Governance Committee. No, nobody. So, members, do you have any questions for any of the representatives on the Combined Authority? I can see no questions. So we note the report, members, and move on. Thank you. Number 11 on our agenda is the Greater Cambridge Partnership. We have a supplementary pack. Um, the report is available from the most recent meeting, which took place on the 17th of March, in a supplementary agenda, which was issued on the 22nd of March. Um, and Councillor Neil Goff is our representative on that um, Partnership. Members, do you have any questions for Councillor Goff? Yes, Councillor Cohn. 
Uh, just a very uh, quick one, Chair. Um, thanks for letting me speak on this. Um, so on page four of the supplementary document, it talks about the um, cycle greenways. Um, and it's a question that I've asked of the board a, a couple of times, really. I just wondered if I could have an update on the link between uh, Fulbourne and uh, Cambridge City, the cycle greenway that goes between the two. Um, obviously, the, the business case has been outlined here, but there just seems to be sort of a, a lack of progress in terms of actually getting spades in the ground for this proposal. And given the importance to my residents, you know, getting them out of cars onto bikes into the city, uh, and um, for the surrounding villages like the Wilbrams, um, you know, because until this project is complete, there's no possibility of linking up to the, the, the first phase of, of the project. I just wonder if I could um, have an update either here or a later date. Councillor Gore. Yes, Councillor Cairns, I'm very happy to answer because actually I think your, um, if I can impute to your question a little bit of frustration and disappointment about uh, the rate of progress on uh, the greenways, I think that was generally uh, expressed both at the assembly and also at the, at the board. Um, what we got um, from the officers was an interim uh, report which does have a timetable associated with it but we request that, requested that what came back in September was a full project schedule with milestones on the way to, to the delivery of these projects because um, well, actually I, I, I completely agree with you we need more urgency associated with that and I think the board was um, was united in that uh, expression that we need to get on with it so um, I have to say, you know, have a look at the report, which was for this, and you'll get a little bit of information, but I'm very hopeful in September you'll get a lot more. Uh, that, that was exactly the point, and, and it wasn't just a time, well, there are time scales which are in the report for the end, but what the board asked for was interim milestones so that we can track how it progresses. Thank you, Councillor Goff. Um, are there any other questions? No. Okay. So, uh, I turn um, with... Sorry, Councillor Daunton? Um, um, yes, uh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Councillor Goff, uh, for that update. Um, clearly, that's important to me as, as one of the members for the Penditton and Fulbourne Ward, and the, including the Wilbrahams. Um, will the report look at the wider scheme and the next phase of the scheme? Uh, yeah, so, so uh, as Councillor Dawson may be aware, there was a question which was asked specifically about the Wilbrahams. I, um, you know, the, the Greenways are universally uh, popular um, and certainly the next uh, evolution of them will be linking, but the priority at the moment is on the, the actual core Greenway schemes which are, fund, which are funded um, uh, by the GCP and, and need to keep uh, proceeding to, to develop and then at that later stage we'll look at the uh, the linking which is so important to make the network work thank you councillor thank you. goff i can't see any other questions so we note those reports i think um num item 12 on the agenda is membership of committees and other bodies so do group leaders wish to notify the council of any changes in the membership of committees are there any changes in the membership of outside bodies to report? Or uh, members, you're, so members, if there are none. Okay. Um, you're asked to note and endorse these changes, the, any, sorry, there are no changes. <laughs> so thank you very much. So we move on to item 13, which is questions from councillors. And members, you're reminded that there is a period of 30 minutes available for questions in total. This includes those questions where notice has been provided as set out on the agenda, and if there is still any time remaining after those questions with notice have been dealt with, we will deal with any questions which have been notified to the Democratic Services Manager before the start of this meeting. So we have a number of questions already, starting with 
Councillor sally Ann Hart, would you like to put your question? Thank you, Chair. And um, I would quite like to actually read my question rather than saying as in the paper, because I'd really like us to, as a council, to focus on the language that's used around people. And so my question, rather than using the term refugee, is actually going to focus on people, all people seeking refuge. So my first question really is, is how many families from the Ukraine seeking refuge have been settled in South Cambridgeshire since the outbreak of the war in Ukraine? Thank you very much. And I believe that's going to be answered by Councillor John Batchelor. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, the simple answer to the question is we don't know. Uh, there simply isn't a mechanism in place currently um, to advise us of these things. Um, as we are all aware, this is a developing situation. Um, what we do know is obviously quite a number of our residents have signed up for the homes for Ukrainian scheme. Um, we're also aware that we do have a small community of Ukrainians uh, who are resident in the South Cams. Uh, that amounts to 112 individuals according to the last census. And we as a council uh, have currently um, just set up a working group which met for the first time on Monday. Um, the purpose of this group is to identify how we can provide support to communities who do receive Ukrainian refugees. Thank you, Councillor Batcher. Did you have a supplementary? Yes, thank you, Chair. So reflecting on the experience of South Cambridgeshire, I'm just wondering then if I could answer the following question uh, in terms of the people um, seeking refuge from Afghanistan and Syria and how many of those families and people have managed to resettle in South Cams. Councillor Batcher. Thank you, Chair. So under the Syrian resettlement scheme, we accommodated three families. Uh, we actually pledged uh, to provide uh, four family homes uh, on an ongoing basis, year on year. Um, since the lockdown, the government has suspended this Syrian settlement program and it hasn't yet restarted. We are still committed to provide uh, ongoing support for the Syrians uh, when this uh, project restarts. Under Afghan settlement scheme, Ermine Street has provided three family homes um, and have a further one uh, awaiting uh, allocation. Uh, we have two families in housing association accommodation within South Cams, and we have one in our own, uh, one family in our own stock. We have another two families due to arrive um, in, the, in our own properties uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, I might say that this whole process has taken an awfully long time. Uh, and properties have been empty for months, uh, which has caused um, you know, issues back in the villages. We clearly we, we want to uh, make the best use of our property that we possibly can. Uh, but uh, we have no control over the allocations. That is purely a, a government function. So to in total, we have um, provided homes for three Syrian families, six Afghan families, and we currently have three more Afghan families due to uh, come to us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Batchelor. Uh, moving on to a question from Councillor Jeff Harvey. You Thank you, Chair. Um, since the introduction of the callback service, um, what is the level of usage of the service and what is the customer reaction? Thank you. Councillor Neil Goff, I believe you're answering this question. Yes, thank you, Councillor Harvey. So um, between November, mid-November 2021 and the end of February, which is three and a half months, first three and a half months since the service was introduced, there were 537 callbacks which were requested. That's quite a low number, but it's also related to the fact that over that period of time, the actual waiting time for the call centre was actually quite low. 
and we expect that those number of callbacks will increase quite significantly in March when the call volumes are always higher. Um, the majority of the callbacks we've re been requested have been between noon and two o'clock when the number of calls into the council are at their highest. There was also an increase in demand, not surprisingly, when the, the call centre was closed um, over the Christmas period. So customer reaction has been very positive with a number of uh, uh, residents commenting it was a pleasant surprise to receive a co prompt call back when requested, as this was not often the case when they'd use similar services with other organisations. Thank you, Councillor Goff. Councillor Harvey, did you have a supplementary question? Not really a supplementary question, but just to say, well, I think this is um, good sense for everyone, isn't it? Because um, nobody wants to waste time hanging on a phone. So um, I, I applaud this, um, this innovation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if you're okay with that, Councillor Goff, we'll move on to uh, item, question 13C from Councillor Claire Daunton. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, as on the agenda. Thank you. So, Councillor Goff. Thank you, Councillor Dawson. So, uh, so, staff are already working in the office where this enables them to work most effectively. However, the ongoing government guidance around COVID and the soon to be completed work on greening South Cams Hall means that there's still some restrictions which are in place. Going forward, the impact of the successful Council Anywhere project, combined with the innovations in working arrangements driven by the need to respond to COVID, means it's unlikely that the traditional pre-COVID working arrangements are ever likely to fully return. Instead, we're asking service teams to work in the way that is most efficient and best serves the needs of residents, members and businesses. The impact of time spent in the office will vary according to between the, between the teams and the nature of the work. But initial estimates are that ongoing occupancy rates are likely to be about 60% of what they were pre-COVID. Thank you. Councillor Daunton, did you have a supplementary question? Um, yes, I, I do, please. Um, what will be the impact of these plans on how we use uh, office space? Um, so we'll adapt to these new circumstances by using our office space more effectively. Um, by providing modern working and collaboration space to allow teams to work together more effectively. Um, that will also include new technology to um, enable people to interact in the office and outside of the office. It will give us the opportunity to rent out a greater proportion of our office space to generate additional income. We've already had several inquiries from organisations looking to use that space. Um, and we'll provide cost-effective space to start-up companies within the district who otherwise would not have the ability to afford physical space. So in combination, these proposals not only allow us to use our own office space more effectively, but also allow us to attract talent in other areas, such as planning and environmental health from a wider geographic area by making the best use of modern technology. Thank you. Thank you. So, moving on to the next question, which is from Councillor Corinne Garvey. When will the ground source heat pumps be operational at South Cambridgeshire Hall? Okay, thank you, Councillor Garvey, for the question. There's, there is still work to be completed, but all the pipes and ducts, as you may have seen, are now installed and will link to the internal wiring system in early May. We now have to complete an upgrade to the building management system, but that system should be commissioned by the end of this month with full autonomous operation by the end of April, and full of completion of the project is expected by the end of June. Thank you, Councillor Goff. Councillor Garvey, did you have a supplementary question? Uh, yes. Um, given the recent increase in energy prices, I presume that as an investment, the returns look rather better than originally expected. Is that the case? That's a go. Yeah, interesting, interesting question. So we're currently engaged in a follow-up, um, uh, in a procurement process for utilities. Uh, and I expect that process is going to be as painful for the council as it is for residents in their purchasing of, uh, of energy at the moment. 
Against that backdrop, the investment we've made in South Cairns Hall in PV solar and ground source heat pumps, which will dramatically reduce our electricity and gas consumption by over 50%, over 50%, just looks inspired. Um, and indeed, the preliminary assessment suggests that the payback period on the project, which was initially estimated to about, be about 20 years when we approved it, will be reduced to somewhere between 10 to 15 years, reflecting the step change in wholesale energy prices since we approved it in 2019. Thank you, Councillor Goff. So, moving on, uh, question 13E from Councillor Eileen Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Um, with the season for community events approaching, how are we planning to support community groups to reduce waste and increase recycling? Can I believe Councillor Brian Milnes will be answering this one? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, so we will continue supporting uh, village events uh, as we have done uh, since we started here four years ago. And we're very keen on obviously doing what we can to reduce waste and increase recycling. Um, as well as the work that uh, we do directly as a council, I've mentioned the work that we do from RECAP as well, which we're a member uh, party to, and they do a lot of work uh, in uh, conjunction um, with our, our villagers. Um, we are supporting uh, community action days as well, where we'll provide skips that will collect metal, for example, uh, small and larger electrical usage you've probably seen. <coughs> I mean, this is in conjunction with schemes like the repair cafes that we're also running. Uh, so uh, some people I know uh, in my own uh, patch, both in Shelford uh, and in Sawston, at their events will be running uh, minor repair cafes on the, on the day. Um, so this is a, um, a, a, among a series of uh, actions that we uh, will continue taking. If you want a list, I can provide you with one where we've already been doing this work. Um, and we're uh, scheduling uh, several, and there's a, one coming up in Camborne uh, for the 14th of May. Thank you, Councillor Milnes. Um, and Councillor Wilson, did you have a follow-up question? I did, thank you. Um, I, I'm very pleased by the support we give to village events, but I wonder whether we could increase the awareness of these services and community action days by contacting parish councils and asking them to spread the information to local community groups. Yes, I think um, we shouldn't um, ignore, and, and we don't, but we should uh, do what we can to reinforce the relationship uh, with the parish councils in this. And we've actually got a lot of support uh, from them uh, in doing this. And they're very pleased to see us helping out at the, these events. So we'll do what we can to uh, increase that communication with them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Milnes. And although we had a question from Councillor Nick Wright, he's posted in the chat that he's having problems with the internet and he is happy to have a, a response in writing. So we'll do that. Uh, moving on to question 13G, Councillor Bunty Waters. Would you like to ask your question, Councillor Waters? Thank you, Chair, as on the agenda paper. Thank you very much. So, Councillor John Batcher, I believe you're answering this one. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Councillor Waters, for your question. Uh, so, on the Ukrainian issue, Urban Street currently is in the position to make two properties available now, uh, and the possibility of further later as they become available. These would be from voids, of which there are usually about 10 or more at any one time. Um, whether or not um, properties are made available to the Ukrainians is, of course, still an, an open question whether there is a demand. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Batchelor. Um, Councillor Waters, did you have a supplementary question? Thank you, Chair. It was just um, that if, if some are made available, could they be offered homes which are suitable for families? near to schools and doctors and in parishes where they would be welcomed 
and assisted and allow the communities to mix and share their experiences and good transport would also help. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Waters. Councillor Batchelor? Yes, we, we would certainly endeavour uh, to do that. You know, there is a whole process about um, settling in uh, all the refugees uh, that we're helping currently. And of course, we will um, select the place which we feel <coughs> is best for them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Batchelor. Uh, so, question 13H is from Councillor Mark Howell. Would you like to ask your question, Councillor Howell? What are the Council's target for self built houses this year? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. I'll just repeat that as it came over slightly muffled. What is the Council's target for self built houses this year? And I think Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins is answering that. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hall, for your question. Um, this year's target for self-built homes based on the current register entries is 204 new homes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hall. Did you have a further question? I do. Well, it's more of a, a request to the Chairman. Um, and I would like to thank uh, Councillor Hawkins for her response. Would it be possible for the leader of the council, or for that matter, the lead member for planning, to attend Caxton Parish Council to explain why nine self-built houses have been granted on appeal outside the village framework in one of the most attractive areas of the village? The planning inspectorate implies that South Cambridgeshire District Council has failed to meet its requirements for self-built housing this year. Thus, the District Council no longer has a five-year land supply where self-builds are offered. It would be nice to know that the lead member or the leader could explain that to the Parish Council. Thank you, Hi. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Councillor Howell. Councillor Dr Tim Hawkins, do you want to respond to that? Uh, yes, Chair, I can respond to that and I am happy to attend uh, the Caxton Parish Council meeting, uh, that's not a problem. But I would also uh, like to clarify uh, the appeal decision that um, has been referred to by Councillor Howell. There is no five-year land supply issue to do with self-build, um, as he said. What it is, is that um, self-build permissions or permission should be given for self-builds as on the register of each authority. Now, obviously, we have had a register available since about, I think, 2016, and that register is not just for those who have connections uh, to this district, but for anyone who wants to live in this district. So my view is that we probably had uh, more <laughs> people wanting to come in onto that register than perhaps would be the case if it was just for people with connections. Now, what the uh, data we have suggests is that those who actually build, self-build or um, uh, custom properties actually don't always um, identify it uh, to us as that. Um, and we have reason to believe that a significant number of permissions have actually been granted that will be suitable for self-builders or custom builders. So what we're doing is we're trying to review our process for collecting and recording that information. Um, and also uh, we'll be looking at reviewing our self-build register. I mean, I know of 10 new builds that are cell builds in my village. So, you know, who knows how many there are elsewhere. But yes, if the uh, parish council wishes to send me an invitation through their clerk, please do so. I'll be happy to attend and explain in person. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much uh, for your question and for the answer. Uh, the next question is from Councillor Steve Hunt. Would you like to put your question, Councillor Hunt? Thank you, Chair. Does the Council have any energy supply contracts with Gazprom or any other Russian energy company? And I believe that's being answered by Councillor Neil Goff. Uh, 
Yes, thank you, uh, Councillor Hunt. Um, I, I, no, unlike some other councils, we don't have any direct energy supply contracts with Gazprom. Um, we understand that some of our suppliers may have sourced a small proportion of their wholesale supply from Gazprom, which they're seeking to extract themselves from, but we don't have any direct energy contracts with them. Thank you. Councillor Hunt, did you have a supplementary? Yes, I do. Thank you, Chair. Uh, hasn't the Ukrainian crisis underlined the real value of self-generation investments that can be undertaken to reduce our dependency on external energy sources and thus you know, enhance our energy security? Thank you. Councillor Gold? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, I've mentioned previously the projects that we've undertaken in terms of uh, South Camps Hall, which will reduce our energy uh, dependency. Um, but that also extends to what we've done and what we're planning to do at Water Beach Depot with PV Solar. Um, our plans for further investment in purchasing electric refuse vehicles will move us towards less dependence on fossil fuels. Um, but also we're looking at energy efficiency on our own housing stock. And we've also encouraged others uh, through our zero carbon community grants as well to pursue energy um, schemes. Um, and, and Residents themselves can take similar steps to um, ensure that their own generation opportunities are maximised and that they look for ways to minimise their consumption too as well. And we've done a lot to educate uh, our residents and the opportunities in that space as well. So I think you're, you're absolutely right in terms of the linkage between the actions we're taking and reducing uh, energy um, dependency on external sources. And I think it's really fair to say that we're actually leading the way on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Councillor Dr. Shrabona Bhattacharya, have your question. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. I have, I have my question printed on the as it, So as it's read on the paper, yeah, thank you. As on the paper. So I believe Councillor Bridget Smith, leader, you're going to... Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your question, uh, Councillor Bhattacharya. Um, so, the Council's shared planning service has been engaging with the potential developer for the High Street for a number of years, and there's been a considerable number of meetings very recently. Um, and I think um, Stephen Kelly has got another one arranged, but, you know, within the next matter of days. So, the Camborne High Street project, project, as you know, is complicated by the need for a significant additional development costs, which are associated with the, to, the need to move expensive underground services and to widen and realign the road to form a high street. And I remember coming to the town council to explain that. And those costs are over and above what might be expected for a site and development of this type. So that's what makes delivery of a mixed use proposal, which incorporates additional retail and related commercial spaces on the ground floor, even harder to achieve. So the commercial complexities are really non-trivial. And as I said, I attended uh, the town council when there was still a parish council, I think you were in attendance actually, um, a number of years ago now to explain why it wasn't feasible to proceed with the scheme that um, was being muted in 2018 um, because it would have involved significant um, public money involvement. And the town council at the time seemed to fully understand that and were, uh, you know, it, was a very, it was a very positive meeting with them. So it's also really important that actually we seek, and I'm talking about now, what we're, what we're looking at now, so it's really important that we seek to achieve a development that Camborne will be proud of. So I don't want to be driving past a new high street and think, well, we should have done better here. You know, Camborne have waited a long time for this high street and it needs to be really good. So if we deliver something that's poor, it actually won't be in anyone's long-term interest. And you know that, you know, COVID has really strung a very bright light on the challenges that high streets are facing these days. So they have to be multifunctional. They have to be places where people want to go in order to encourage the footfall that's needed to keep them going. And places with um, high streets and town centres that are looking sad and aren't fit for purpose are just in major, major decline. So in an attempt to re-establish the, the momentum that has possibly been lost during COVID, 
Um, the Joint Director of Planning, Stephen Kelly, has recently met with the potential, potential developer and representatives of the Town Council to explore how the concerns, which I'm sure you share, um, which are being expressed at the pre-application stage might be resolved. And these are to do with the quality of the build. And what, so we've got to make sure that the planning application, which is submitted sooner rather than later, is going to be one su that succeeds. Thank you, Lydia. Councillor Bhattacharya, did you have a supplementary? Yes, I do have a question. Something in short, which is not delivered actually. So the question is that what what method of communication will you will you follow to the common people just to convey them the i mean just to convey them the jobs have haven't been done through the letters or the uh, through the letters of the leaflets is that your question yeah that is a question how the, so, so how the common how people will you know about that jobs have not been done how will you advise the residents about the work that has not yet been done so i I'm sorry, I, I, don't, I don't know why you're saying jobs haven't been done. Everything's been done. This is, a, this is a process. It's a long and complex process. And, you know, we have to make sure there's two factors that have to stack up. What is the cost of this? And, you know, we're talking about a commercial developer here, and it has to work financially for a commercial developer. And our response, but that's the, that's the developer's responsibility, our responsibility is to make sure that if a planning application is submitted, it is a planning application that can potentially be approved because it's good, because it's good enough. And, you know, we all know when we're dealing with uh, planning applications that the spectre of viability is always there and there's, we're often forced into compromise in order to... Um, maintain developers um, profit profit margins but this high street is really really important the success of Camborne and the new development going on around around it really hangs on the success of this this high street so there are no jobs that haven't been done I agree with you things have been slower than I would have liked um, a lot of that is outside of our control but, you know, Stephen Kelly is, um, has really got the bit between his teeth and is doing the utmost to move this forward as fast as he possibly can to the point at which a, a, a good, fit-for-purpose planning application can be submitted. Now, if you're, if you're wanting us to um, be communicating more consistently and more regularly with residents, then I'm very happy to take that away and give that some consideration about how, as a council, we can keep the residents of Camborne uh, more fully informed about progress as of, as of now. Thank you very much, Leader. Uh, the next question is from Councillor Graham Cone, 13K. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. It's as written on the order paper. Thank you. Councillor Smith. Uh, thank, thank you very much indeed, Councillor, Councillor Cohn. So, um, we all want EV charging um, to move faster than it is. Um, you know, we need, I think we've done very well uh, in the absence of any additional powers or money from government. So, thus far, we've installed six electric charging points for cars and vans at the Water Beach Depot, and we had a, the benefit of a small grant of £2,000 from the workplace charging scheme. Um, we've all, also put in an additional three charging points for refuse vehicles, which were wholly funded by South Cams. Um, we've also completed the installation of 12 charge points at 270 Cambridge Science Park. And at South Cams Hall, where we are now, there will be, very soon, a total of 20 charge points for staff, visitors, and taxis, and I hope members as well, because I've got an electric car now, um, and that should be available from, from June of this year. And a further three charge points will be operational by June 22 in community room car parks. Now, there's obviously a lead role for the Cambridge and Peterborough Combined Authority to take on this, and um, I was promised the EV charge policy, policy 
before Christmas. I've been promised it again by February. February's come and gone, and we still don't have it. So I think it's now probably wrapped up in the, uh, the rework of the local transport, transport plan, which, have certainly, which has turned into a much bigger piece of work. So, you know, given the powers, given the money, we will, we will move faster. Um, because if we're going to uh, drive that modal shift of people off uh, petrol and diesel cars, there, ha there has to be a really good network of electric vehicle charging throughout the district, including okay. in our villages. Cornhall, thank you very much. We've had the end of the 30 minutes um, for questions, so thank you. You've answered the, the first question, and we can't take any further questions. So thank you. Uh, Moving on then, uh, if any question um, was on the paper that has not received an answer, uh, we can liaise with democratic services as to whether that is uh, given in writing. Thank you. So thank you very much for that interesting range of questions. Um, we now move on to notices of motion. And you're reminded that a maximum period of 30 minutes is allowed for each motion to be moved, seconded, and debated, including dealing with any amendments. At the expiry of the 30-minute period, debate will cease immediately, and the mover of the original motion, or if the original motion has been amended, the, mo the mover of that amendment, now forming the substantive motion, will have the right of reply before the motion or amendment is put to the vote. And I would remind members, and I will just check with uh, legal, that there are five minutes for the proposer, three minutes for other speakers. Thank you. So the first motion is from Councillor Heather Williams. Uh, would you like to um, move your motion, Councillor Heather Williams? Thank you, Chair. As councillors, we have faced challenges that we would never have dreamed of in relation to COVID-19. We have spoken in mourning over the brutal murder of an MP. And now today, Chair, we will be speaking of war in Europe. I am sure we have all watched in horror and great sadness as the war in Ukraine has unfolded. Chair, I think we should note today the amazing defence the Ukrainian people are doing and the many people like us who are taking up arms to defend their nation. Many of us have sat at home feeling helpless and looking for a way in which to help. Events like this should make us sit up and reflect. For myself, the words of my school hymn have been ringing in my ears. One heart, one spirit, one motto and aim. May faith be strong and never fail us. It is crucial for the world that we wish to raise our children and grandchildren that faith in freedom will prevail is as strong for us today as it was in the first half of the 20th century. By endorsing this statement, we will be showing our local government colleagues in Ukraine, people just like us, who have put themselves forward to serve their communities via democratic process that we support them. And we should make no mistake that Putin is trying to undermine democracy in his actions. And it is the duty of each and every one of us to stand up for democracy and the people of Ukraine in any way we can. Supporting a statement and flying a flag may be a small thing for us to do, but it is often in the simplest actions that you will find the widest smiles. To conclude, Chair, I would like to end on a famous quote that I'm sure many of us will recognize. Though we may come from different countries and speak in different tongues, our hearts beat as one. And with that sentiment of collaborative working and support for the people of Ukraine, I move this motion. Thank you, Councillor Heather Williams. And is that motion seconded? Uh, I'm happy to second the motion. Thank you. So, uh, the motion is open for debate. Uh, I believe we have yes. Councillor Smith. And uh, thank you. Um, we've submitted an amendment to the motion, which is with Democratic Services. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was distracted. I was trying to um, see who the other speakers were. Thank you. 
so we have an amendment uh, to this motion. Let's give us a moment to read it. Uh, certainly, yes, certainly. I can make it bigger. Let's take my glasses. Oh, there we are. Okay, so this council, so it, it retains the um, text of the, um, of the proposal, but it, the, it changes the intention at the end. So it's instead of the three bullet points on our page V, it is the council will endorse the statement, pledge to support all those seeking refuge as a result of this conflict, work with government, but we will need the government to do more to establish accessible, swift and safe routes to the UK for all of those fleeing Ukraine and to assist the local councils in their work welcoming and supporting refugees from Ukraine. This includes clarity on safeguarding measures, ongoing support once the initial period has passed, and assistance for people seeking refuge, I think that means, to find work as soon as they wish after arrival. And finally, continue to fly the Ukraine flag in solidarity with our local government colleagues and the people of Ukraine. Um, so, Councillor Heather Williams, would you be prepared to accept that amendment? I'm pragmatic, Chair, so I will. Thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, would anybody like to debate that amended, amendment, amended no, motion? No, no, it's not amended. That's the oh, substantive motion. That is now the substantive motion. So, would we like to debate the substantive motion? So, we have speakers. So, Councillor Smith. Thank you very much. So, um, the District Council Network, of which I am the Vice, Vice Chair to uh, Councillor Sam Chapman at, at Allen, um, have put a lot of effort into um, discussing what the role of district councils in, in dealing with people from the Ukraine who are seeking refuge in this country. And um, Councillor Sam Chapman Allen wrote uh, this week, earlier this week, to Clive Betts, MP, who's leading on this, just to highlight all the issues which we at district council level need clarity on. So, you know, we are all absolutely, you know, willing to do, do our utmost. But, you know, the government is leaving lots and lots of questions unanswered for us. And if we're going to do a really job, good job, we need answers. So I'm just going to go, he sent a, a three-page document. I'm just going to pull out some of the things that we're, uh, we are asking uh, Clive Betts MP for clarity over. So what housing inspections and health and safety checks will council be expected to undertake? What vetting and security checks of sponsors and or people seeking refuge will councils be expected to undertake? What safeguarding and wraparound support requirements will there be for us to make? What responsibilities will councils have for providing language support? What responsibilities will council have for providing additional support for younger children? What will council's legal obligation as housing providers be to those seeking refuge at the end of the six to 12 month period if the sponsor no longer wishes to accommodate them? What are the implications and obligations for councils if a sponsorship arrangement breaks down? What happens if a new sponsor can't be found? Will councils have a duty to house people seeking refuge under the family visa scheme if their relatives can't make their own arrangements? Will the £350 sponsorship payment be ignored for benefits and council tax purposes? Could it push people's pension thresholds through the declarable tax position? Will the scheme turn sponsors into landlords or create new obligations to, to people seeking refuge as tenants? What benefits will people seeking refuge be entitled to? How will they be administered? What procedural requirements will there be for them to take up in flow? Please could I have a bit of respect here. Has consideration be given to the needs of older refugees and the help they'll need? What technical equipment, such as phones and laptops, can be provided to people seeking refuge? And how will that be provided? What data will be, ama be made available to councils about the number and regional distribution of people seeking refuge? How frequently will it be updated? And will ca how councils will be better able to support if they get upfront details about individuals and the daily flow of data? And I could go on and on. So this is cross-party... All parties have signed up to this and sent this to the minister. So, you know, we are all willing, but government have to, you know, have to help us. And we, if they help us, 
we will help them. It's, we cannot assume that they're doing everything they, they could and should be doing now. They're going to need to be pushed into giving us the tools to do the job really well. Thank you. And might I remind members that we all, all members who speak, have three minutes to speak. Uh, Councillor Nigel Cathcart. Thank you. Yes, I think I, I fully support the humanitarian initiatives that have been undertaken and outlined by Bridget Smith uh, and the work that the council is already doing. In fact, I think this is excellent and that's a fit and proper role for a council. Um, as far as the statement is concerned, there are many elements that I agree with, but I think we, we have to consider this in a, in a slightly different context, that certainly I don't support this war in any way. I haven't supported the wars in Afghanistan or in uh, Iraq or any of these others, and for the same reason I don't support the Russian intervention. But I do have a number of Russian friends, and it needs to be borne in mind that one of the, one of the factors that colors their actions is the huge losses Russia suffered in the last war. And the fact that a great fear uh, is that uh, Ukraine could join NATO and you would have nuclear weapons jammed up against the Russian border. Now, Israel is quite rightly concerned with the same objective in as far as Iran. And for those old enough like me to remember it, in the 1962 missile crisis, America was per se prepared to risk nuclear war on exactly the same issue. So this is something that I think is a legitimate concern. And this war, like all wars, is a failure of diplomacy. There was a diplomatic solution here if, we, if the world, including Russia and everyone, had been able to grasp it which was for uh, Ukraine not to join NATO, to be broadly neutral and to have some enforcement in place to ensure that would happen. This could well have avoided this particular conflict. So I think, uh, as I say, I've spoken to a number of Russian friends and they do need this, if you like, the Russians' perspective to be looked at. This is not to support the war. I've stressed that at the point of, of repetition, but it's to understand the actually extremely... Uh, emotive issue that this has become uh, and, and it does colours everyone's judgment including clearly those in Russia um, so I think we do need to look at it uh, uh, from that sort of perspective and as I said before all wars are a failure of diplomacy uh, and I think flying the flag I can understand the reason for it but one of my concerns is that if we're not careful we'll give encouragement to the Ukrainians which is fair enough but we may well lure them into a sense of optimism uh, for support that won't be forthcoming, which could actually have the effect of lengthening and prolonging the war, lengthening the destruction and the loss of lives. So paradoxically, and this is an uncomfortable truth that you have to recognize, paradoxically, by giving them support, we may actually be creating the very circumstances under which more destruction could well occur. Uh, so there is a huge range, of horror, huge range of issues here which actually need to be uh, looked at. And I would like to feel that we can, or, or the world community as a matter of great urgency, could facilitate some sort of um, diplomatic right. solution which would uh, to a close, look at the interests right. of all sides in this dispute and come up with a solution as a matter of great urgency. Um, thank you um, very much, Councillor Cathcart. Uh, Councillor Martin Khan. And Councillor <coughs> Cathcart, could you turn your microphone off now? Thank you. Councillor Cathcart, could you turn your microphone off? Uh, probably one of the, the only person here who has actually dealt with local authorities in Ukraine. Um, I, 20 years ago, I was involved in a, uh, cooperation projects across the Polish and Ukrainian border, with the uh, partner being the, the uh, local authority of Yavari, which was, as you may re recently remember was the target of cruise missiles. I actually had been through the actual um, training center, which was hit by the missiles when I was there. Uh, so it means it's, it really hit me quite emotionally to see that happen. Um, I want to emphasize the importance in the post, uh, as this war will end, it inevitably will end. Um, we just hope it's soon rather than later, of the, the, the links between local authorities. The cooperation between local authorities at that time drew attention to the differences between the approaches in the East and West, which is rather parallel to the, 
the conflict you're seeing now in the sense that the local authority, when I first arrived at the local authority, I was brought in to, to meet the head of the local, in fact, it was the devolved government department, which is the nature of the local authority. The, the real local authorities had virtually no money whatsoever. Um, and he was sitting in a room in full dress uniform, sitting at the table with his arms like this, uh, uh, like this, um, with the Ukrainian um, symbol behind him, basically expressing power. Uh, it was really very striking. I found out later that this man lived in a three million pound house in Lviv, um, you know, which three million pounds in Ukraine means a lot more than three million pounds here. The whole system was different. This was under Kukma, it was corrupt. Um, uh, they were getting experience with Polish local authorities, which had evolved into a more modern Western style. The experience of seeing the two must have been very dramatic to the people in Ukraine. Our cooperation has an impact. Um, and, I mean, you can see now the, the, the conflict between Ukraine uh, and Russia being a conflict of, of approach, you know, of one domineering, centrally guided, autocratic regime which wants to control everything, and another regime which has evolved tremendously since 2000, um, which has evolved from a, a system whereby there was a, this great conflict between the Russian speaking and the Ukrainian speaking, becoming to design that they get, must have a, a national identity as a whole. Um, uh, like in the sense that the Western countries try and do between their different elements in their society. Um, so I see that maintaining links with local, between local authorities will be very important, and I, I, I feel want to emphasize that element in the proposal, uh, the comments in this, this motion. Um, Thank you very much, Councillor Khan, for that insight. Uh, we also have a wish to speak from Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to Councillor Williams for accepting um, the amendment. My concern has been that racism was present in Ukraine, still is. That blacks and Asians who stand out were being denied the opportunity to leave Ukraine. They were thrown off trains, priorities given to white Ukrainians. So when I saw this motion, whilst I am completely um, on the side of Ukrainians who have this horrible thing on them, which they didn't ask for, lives are at risk. I support getting them out. But what really was of conflict for me was the way in which they were treated people of minority ethnic who stood out, even the ambassador to the UK in front of the Parliamentary Home Affairs Committee seemed to support this thing. Oh, we'll take them somewhere else because they stand out and people think we're giving them priority. Come on, that wasn't right. And I don't think our government has actually done anything about it. So thank you in any event for allowing us to make this um, um, amendment, which clarifies that all Refugees, whatever they might be, are supported in getting out of Ukraine. Thank you. Members, um, I'd remind you that if we want to get through this and get it voted through, which it sounds as though people are broadly in support, uh, we need to um, shorten our speeches. Uh, Councillor Milnes. That is really disappointing that... 2022, we're re recollecting scenes of similar nature in the 1930s and 40s. Putin's disruptive policies have ranged from setting up neo-Nazi groups in his own country and far-left groups, to uh, interference in uh, democracies in the West, including Brexit, and in the 1990s, Russia agreed with Ukraine that it would have no territorial claims 
on Ukraine. Where is that agreement now? In tatters. The poor people of Ukraine are just Putin's pawns. And we should mark by this our revulsion at the, those actions. Slava Ukraini. Thank you. Um, member, I just want to point out we have uh, Councillor Grenville Chamberlain, uh, Councillor Deborah Roberts, and Councillor Bhattacharya, uh, but we also need to allow time for um, the seconder to sum up. So um, I'd ask you to keep your speeches short. So, Councillor Grenville Chamberlain. Thank you, Chair. I will be short. I will unconditionally support this motion. We need to get people to safety. It won't be easy providing safe routes out of Ukraine unless there is, uh, God forbid, a no-fly zone or, or NATO boots on the ground. Um, once they get out of Ukraine, we need to get them here. And the questions that the leader has raised are things that need to happen when the people are safe. Let us get them out first and get them back into this country. Thank you very much, Councillor Grenville Chamberlain. And Councillor Deborah Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. Through you, Chairman. There isn't a Russian perspective on this, and I don't expect anybody, oh, I'm very surprised anybody in this room should actually be speaking up for the Russians here. Um, they have a fascist dictatorship that's doing exactly what Hitler did um, taking other people's countries, storming in, testing the rest of the world. Um, stealing people from their own countries and taking them into Russia. These are exactly the sort of things that Adolf Hitler did. And it's exactly the same intention. And I'm afraid at the end of the day, somebody will have to stand up to this man because he will keep going. And unlike most of you in this room, I have a son-in-law in the military. He's in the rifles. He has a gun. He takes to war. He's been in Afghanistan, he's been in Iran. And he is quite aware of the danger that lies ahead. And so we should all be. And in the end, I'm afraid, in the end, we will have to deal with this man. And it will not be a question of diplomacy. He doesn't understand diplomacy. He only understands fear and terror and being an utter bully boy. And many years ago, when Poland was in, invaded, we had a duty. We'd said we'd go to support Poland, and we did. And we stood alone for many years. It was a long time before America came in. But we stood, and we are exactly the same sort of people as we were then, I believe. And I think, in the end, if we come up to, come up to the mark, we will. But I don't think, I hope, and I, I got a little distressed here in Bridget's um, uh, list, because I, it is not an easy task to bring people into this country. And Bridget's got a lot of questions, but it's not an easy game that the um, government is, is going to have to be doing. So I think we all need to, to have a degree here of understanding from councils dealing with the government, because... Um, this is a very chaotic situation as well in many, in many ways. Um, but I think we do need to support this. I think, you know, we need to support it as one and not be political about it. Um, I'm sorry, I do not believe that um, the Ukrainians are a racist people. Neither are we in this country. Uh, and I get quite offended at the continuing... Uh, drip dripping of that, you know, there's always a racist element. There is a tiny percentage of far right people in Ukraine, a tiny percentage. The, the leadership of Ukraine is Jewish. That in itself is, is a special identity. So I don't think it's right to call them racist that they've been. Ambassador Roberts, please, would you draw to a close? The time has. Elapsed. Yes, I will, Chairman. And we, I, I'm keen to ensure that Councillor Cohn gets his opportunity to speak. We have Councillor Bhattacharya who also wishes to speak and uh,
Councillor Pippa Halings has registered to speak rather late on. So I, I want to give all of those people time to speak and for Councillor Heather Williams to sum up. So, uh, well, my fin final, so, final line is let's not make this at any time now or in the future months or years. Let's not make this a political... Uh, I don't think we are, Councillor Roberts. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Councillor Bhattacharya, and as I say, please do keep your comments yeah, concerned. thank you. Very short. You. I, will, I will support this motion, and uh, because I believe the charity begins at home, that's why the South Cambridgeshire, uh, South Cambridgeshire District Councils, so I have taken a few act actions. Uh, so I am running a couple of the charity events along with the along with the transportation. The things are going to Poland refugee camps directly and through my charity that I am running in Camborne. We have the sitting dinner and the coffee morning. I will request the councillor to come and join because my family house was uh, my family house was bombed in World War II by the Japanese in uh, Japanese people in uh, in uh, in Rangoon. So that's why I always believe that whatever I can do, I will support it that way along with this motion. And one more interesting fact that I would also like to share because here is a discussion about the Russian people. There are also the Russian Russian residents, those who are staying in South Camps uh, here uh, locally. Currently, very, uh, currently, they are actually changing their names and identity when they are going outside and events. So this happened in front of me. Um, that's I just wanted to put in the attention. Thank you very much, Councillor Bhattacharya. Uh, Councillor Pippa Halings, briefly, please. Thank you, and I would also like to support this motion, but I, I just wanted to link actually what um, Councillor Beverly Chamberlain and the leader said, because I think they're, they're the same thing, which is we absolutely need to have the possibility for safe secure passage as swiftly and simply as possible for all of those families that are fleeing this devastating war. At the moment, the, by doing it just through families opening up, I'm being contacted, and I'm sure you are, we're part of the local groups of Homes for Ukrainians, I'm being contacted time and time again with the, the, the terrible red tape bureaucracy because you have to fill in a form per person in the family in English on your either print it out in Ukraine or on the Polish border, or have enough data connectivity on your phone to do it online in English. And what, so the families here are saying, how do I help you do that? How do I match? Um, and it's this brokeraging, which we've just heard today, local authorities have done this with the Syrian and with the Afghan refugees. Let's just use the expertise that's there, the systems that are there in place. So I think we're all saying the same thing. Let's just please just use the systems that are in place and make it as simple as possible for people to get out before it's too late. That's what Thank I'm you. Um, we have four minutes to get this voted through. So, Councillor Cohn, do you have your right to speak? Uh, uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I'll, I'll be brief. So, going back to the, the, the actual motion, I know this is sort of an emotive subject, you know, given, the, given the topic, and I've, you know, share the, the views of many of the, the people that have spoke but re really this motion is about us working t together not not against you know local government or national government or different bits of local government or, or, or whatever it, it should be about us just working together and supporting each other for for, for the outcomes you know that, that we've all talked about to support people coming here so you know um I hope it doesn't sort of turn into political, political football as such. I think it's just the, the motion is very clear. It's us supporting the efforts, work, you know, and, and the amendment, happy with that, working with government. You, you know, it should just be us trying to um, help people as best we can. Thank you very much. And Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. So... The purpose, I want to reflect back to the purpose when I brought this motion, was to give us all an opportunity to demonstrate united support for, for those seeking refuge and for those affected in many ways with the conflict, the unnecessary conflict that is occurring. Um, I, I have to say that I, I do disagree around 
um, striking an agreement. Ukraine is a self-governing nation and they should be allowed to decide for themselves without outside interference in a democratic way how they wish to, to have run their country. And I think that is, that is a fundamental principle that I highlighted and that, that actually by uniting, despite being different parties, despite being different tiers of government, you know, it will only work if everybody works together. And that might be naive, um, that might be a sort of rose-tinted view, but it's a very pragmatic and realistic prospect that, you know, and I, I will not shame myself by getting into party politics or going on a political rant. It's completely uncalled for and unnecessary, unhelpful, and anybody looking in in this chamber will not give anybody any credit for doing that. So when we speak on this, and when we take this forward, as I hope we will, I very much hope that people will take it in that spirit and will vote for this because it's the right thing to do for those people and it's the right thing for us to be supporting the, the people who are horrific victims at the, at the dealt, dealt by an evil man, in my view. And on something that Councillor Robert said, you know, many of us, perhaps, I know myself and her, have family and friends that serve or are on reservist lists because they have served. And I'm incredibly proud of their tours through when they've stood up for democracy and freedom. And I very much hope it's not needed, but if so, then that should happen again in this case. Thank you. Um, and I don't think anybody was having a political rant. Uh, I think we're, as we said earlier on, that there was general support for this. So I think we'll move to um, a vote. And can I ask the webcasting officer to conduct an electronic vote on the basis of the now amended motion? Uh, thank you. We have that on your um, microphones. So if you would like to vote um, for the motion, it's green, against the motion is red, and abstain is yellow. It looks as if there is one person who has not voted, so everybody in the room appears to have voted. I'm sorry? I thought I had. Can you tell if anybody hasn't voted? Okay, so there's 29 in the room, 28 people have voted in favour and one abstention, so that motion is carried. Thank you, members. So, uh, moving on, uh, we, our next motion is from Councillor Sue Ellington. Uh, so, Councillor Ellington, would you like to move your motion? Right. Um, just one moment. Erin, um, would you like to take the vote down from our microphones? Thank That's you. Good. Thank you. It's, it's gone now. Councillor Sue Ellington, yeah. do, do propose your motion. Thank you, Chair. I have proposed this motion because those of us who have lived along the route of the A14, including Girton, Histon, Oakington, Maddingley, Dry Drayton, Bar Hill, Longstanton, Lulworth, Swavesey, Foxworth, Connington and Fendrayton, have suffered greatly during the upgrade, not least the removal of all green vegetation, woods, hedgerows, specimen trees and shrubs, many of which, I have to say, I saw planted 60 or 70 years ago um, by my father mostly, uh, around my uh, Lulworth and Swavesey, plus the amount of soil and total demolition 
of our flat landscape to create hills, hardcore, roadways, and bridges. In other words, a total destruction of all the established wildlife. We were promised trees, shrubs, and hedgerows, which would at least double the green landscape and encourage biodiversity using words like green corridor and eco-friendly environment. Well, it hasn't happened. What we have is hundreds and thousands of these. You must have your visual aids when you do a presentation. Up to 95% of the shrubs, trees, and hedgerows, which are supposed to protect, these are supposed to protect, are dead. Because they were planted at the wrong time of the year, not watched, not cared for, and not put in soil that grows things. The administration of this, is, of this council is supposed to be eco-friendly. It's time we take every positive action and write a strong letter to Highways England and follow it up to ensure we do end up with a great green and biodiverse. Think of all the birds and animals and everything else, rabbits, um, green A14, and not a very uneco picture of plastic and one has to ask why we were allowed to have all this plastic which will now be spread from here to there and back again uh, as rubbish along our A14 in our ditches and along our roads, roadsides. I urge you to support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Ellington. And for bringing in your visual aid, do you have a seconder for your motion? I'm uh, happy to second Thank it. you, Bunt Councillor Bunty Waters. Uh, and Councillor Waters, do you reserve your right to speak or do you want to speak now? I'll speak at the end, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, I believe there might be an amendment, so Councillor Brian Milnes. Thank you. I think um, uh, our Democratic Services Officer has a version of the motion that we have agreed with um, uh, Councillor Ellington on, a, on a, a change of words. Um, if uh, you wish I could read either some of it or all of it out uh, oh, for no. clarity, because we, um, we've, we've got a version uh, showing the changes. Councillor Mills, do come As, If read everybody's it. Could happy. You, could you read the amendment for us? It's quite long. Um, Make it bigger on the screen and we can perhaps read it ourselves. If I, if yeah. I read the uh, first paragraph um, and then uh, tried to um, abridge the other paragraphs. So this council has a policy of being green to the core. National highways in the construction of the A14 have failed to adequately maintain and nurture the newly plant planted trees, shrubs and bushes. According to a 2020 survey, 94% of the trees planted had died. These were, the these were intended to replace thousands of established trees, bushes and hedgerows, which were removed along the routes, which were, we were assured would be replaced twofold. So we absolutely support uh, this uh, motion with the amended words that uh, Councillor Ellington has agreed to. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, offer this amended version to the uh, Council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mills. Could we scroll the reading, the right words up so we can read the rest of it? Um, thank you. That's fine. So uh, can I can I ask if that amendment is accepted? Agreed. Thank you. Um, so that becomes a substantive. It uh, becomes a substantive motion, and so we ha do we have any? The, so the debate it's been seconded. So the debate is open. Uh, do we have any speakers? Councillor Mills. 
Uh, just briefly, because um, the reason that uh, we've asked for this amendment is uh, because there's been sort of hot news since uh, Councillor Ellington um, uh, first postulated or uh, offered her uh, motion. Uh, and that, uh, in the last couple of days, has been um, uh, reflected in the, in the media where National Highways has made a response to uh, Councillor Edmund Murphy's County Council motion of a very similar nature. And it shows that we're uh, very much in agreement over the uh, appalling work that National uh, Highways or England Highways as it was, Highways England uh, as it was, uh, did on the A14. The last paragraph of the amendment refers uh, to the A428 uh, which is a, that imminent project, and we must make sure that national highways don't do this awful desecration that they did that Councillor Ellington eloquently described. Um, I remember going uh, to Bar Hill uh, and seeing uh, the scorched earth policy of removal of, uh, of greenery alongside the road. Much of that was completely unnecessary, um, and the planting itself was com completely negligent. So we, we need to write in the firmest uh, terms to Highways England uh, to reinforce the um, uh, response that looks as though finally has come from them. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Halings. Thank you, and I'm um, very happy to support this. Um, and I think I'd just like to give an emphasis, not just to the writing of the letter, but the following up on this because um, I think as Councillor Ellington knows, just, you know, just coming into this council in 2018, what I came in on the back of was the devastating, very, very painful experience of all of the trees and vegetation of Histon and Peaton being stripped out without any warning, without any community consultation, and without following the ecological code of conduct. And what we found was it's not enough to write a letter. You have to actually bring them to the table and show that you are following up and that they are accountable for this. Even when we did that and got the promises, what you can now see is the community have created a green gateway of 850 planted trees where the scorch earth um, action took place. Together with the highways, National Highways Now, um, area of their planted saplings as well, exactly as you've shown, Councillor Ellington. We went back as a community and replanted the ones that died because we know that there have been conditions that have led to the death. You have to go back and maintain and look after, and they are there. In comparison, right next door, to just two metres away, are the National Highways trees, dead, in the same area. And this is all about just looking after this. And I just want to say, we saw, and as a council, there has been a response about the A148. National Highways has not learnt. It does not intend to learn. And what we had to do as a council was to hold them to account and use all of our powers to do that. We need to do the same, and I support this, this motion. Thank you, Councillor Halings. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, and um, obviously, fully supportive of the motion that's been brought and I would just reflect on the visual aid that was shown to us in that I do believe that we as a nation have been planting trees since before plastic was created um, and it, I think that's something that we probably do need to look into particularly when we're going through planning and the likes that actually where does this plastic go and these, these wrappers and I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm a big fan of looking to the past to for you know, solutions to the present. Um, that's probably the part, the history part of my degree that, that brings that out in me. And there are so many ways that it could be done better than, than just sticking some plastic and some cable ties around. So, um, so I think that's something as well that we should be looking at. And I think we do have, although we have this issue in general, we need to look at how we monitor and having baseline data. I've said a couple of planning applications now, it's really really vital and would welcome works around that so then when we go back to developers or go back to highways england that you know we can really hold them to account um, because we'll have a reference point to, to patch back to thank you uh councillor neil Goff. yes um so i i fully support um this motion and 
I think it's really interesting to see that councillors such as us and the, the county council can have a can have an impact um, on highways England or national highways or whatever they're called whatever their rebranding rebranding is uh, to, uh, to, to to do this and and uh, I'd particularly like to pay um, tribute to uh, councillor uh, Ed Murphy from the county council uh, who brought the motion uh, to the county council on this and it and it does show that you know, the, our actions can actually uh, be brought to bear in terms of, of making uh, organisations such as, um, as this uh, sort of think about what they're doing and, and, and how, to, uh, how to do better. The key thing is um, that we keep up the pressure, that, that it is, becomes relentless. Now, uh, this motion and the one at the County Council has sort of put them on notice. Um, what needs to be followed up with is relentless attention uh, to making sure that the actions to uh, re remediate the situation are, are, sort of, are taken. Um, and most importantly, as well, is that we extend the learning of this process to the A428. And I have been involved in that process. Um, it, is not, it is not as good a process of engagement with um, national highways as it should be. Uh, and, and the lessons which we've learned on, on this need to be applied uh, there. And I, I'm really pleased to report that the actual officers from South Camps who are working on this have, have really grasped the, the nettle in that and are really sort of doing a sterling job in terms of uh, making the, the views of residents and the interests of residents uh, clear uh, on these major projects. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Goff. And Councillor Martin Khan. <coughs> I, I worked 30 years ago in a local authority and was, one of the jobs we were doing was dealing with tree planting. Um, and one of the problems always was when putting out a contract for tree planting was how do we make sure that we get a tree planter that's going to actually get tree, plant trees which will live rather than trees which are planted cheap, the cheapest, the cheapest and most rapidly, but uh, the trees will die. The problem is that if you get a, a, a very cheap price, which uh, the tree planters will go out, take the bare root trees, leave them out in the open air so they get dry, all the roots die, you're planting dead trees. And no wonder you've only got 5% that survive. You need the way of doing it properly is to go out, you go out, you keep the roots, roots wet, you probably soak them, you keep bun, peel them in when they arrive, um, keep the roots wet, uh, make sure that they're still wet when you're planting them in the ground, put them in with a bit of compost. Or if you're planting uh, potted trees, you have to hit the tree, spread the roots out before you plant it. It's not a simple job. It, you, if you put in people who've got no skill or not properly taught, they will do it badly. And that, I suspect, from the evidence that we have of the low survival rate, is what has happened here. And so it is absolutely vital that we keep it on to these people and ensure that when they're contracting, they contract competent people, because that's what it really comes down to. And it's the contractual relationship with a person who's planting them, make sure that they're competent people, they're not just doing it the cheapest, they're doing it well. And the more fuss we make, the more we keep on at it, uh, the more they will learn from their bad experiences, uh, the, 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 the person who's doing the contracting. So I thoroughly support the motion. Thank you. And um, I will make my own contribution here. I'm a fully fledged tree planter myself, <laughs> having planted a tree in the civic capacity. Um, at uh, Mosgrave Way in Flenditton as part of the Queen's Green Canopy. Uh, and that's part of my civic role for this, this uh, district council. Uh, I did that just a few weeks ago. And I'm very happy to do that because it adds a plum tree to a collection of fruit trees in Mosgrave Way. The point being that I'm also a tree warden for Milton Parish Council. And in a life past, I used to work for the Wildlife Trust. And Councillor Khan is absolutely right. Tree planting is not... Uh, do it once and go away. You have to monitor and look after and water. And when we at this district council were the fortunate beneficiaries of three free trees, I engaged local members in my, my parish um, to water those trees that we planted for a year to make sure that they established properly. Now, what I know is, yes, Councillor Khan is absolutely right. I bet those saplings were stuck on a lorry and allowed to dry out before they even saw the ground. Also, they're going into made ground, which is not natural, not the natural layers of subsoil and surface soil. 
So we do really need to make sure that we hold the national highways to account to ensure that the way in which this is done when these trees are planted, replanted and replaced is done properly um, and that the trees are suitable for the area and that they're looked after. So I absolutely endorse this and thank you very much for taking on the amendment, Councillor Ellington. Um, and uh, I, I absolutely endorse that. One of the other things we might want to bear in mind as communities is that there comes a point, and, and Councillor Ellington, absolutely, tree tubes do not make trees, but they do protect them early on. And if the trees were thriving, we do need to protect trees from rabbits and because they will otherwise chew the bark off and kill the tree that way. So they do serve a purpose, but we as communities can maybe consider going out when the time is right and when the tree is established and when it's able to cope with um, damage from pests, that we go out as communities and remove those tree tubes and dispose of them sensibly because they, they can end up strangling trees in the end. So, you know, it's forward thinking and planning and making sure that it's done properly. Uh, which would be way after the National Highway's commitment to them, which lasts for five years. So I think we as communities need to help with that as well in due course, but once we've made sure that National Highways have taken on their obligation. Thank you. Uh, we need to go back to Councillor Bunty Waters, because you seconded the motion. And, um, oh, sorry. Sorry, yes, sorry. Thank you very much. I'll just, I'll just be quick. So, so completely support this, um, but it's really important that as well as trying to solve the problem or the mistakes of the A14, we actually don't allow those mistakes to be replicated. So I'm very grateful to uh, Chenge Taravinga, who's done an absolutely stonking job on the latest lamentable um, plans from um, whatever they're called now, Highways England, English National Highways. highways. Uh, national highways um, on the A428. So on the subject of trees, the evidence that's been presented said historic losses of planted landscapes, particularly tree belts, on newly completed highway works is the evidence, sometimes requiring successive replanting attempts before planting is successful. And the positive action that is being proposed is strategies must be put in place which ensure that planting is offered the best chance at survival in the conditions given. Generally, it's understood that highway schemes do not receive supplemental watering, so working with the seasons and the current climate is very important. The local area is much drier than other regions of England, and therefore this should be taken into consideration within the EMP. Most planting should occur in the winter when the weather's wetter and planting is generally dormant, allowing roots to grow and establish first and thus have a better chance of supporting a growing plant during the warmer seasons. It's just a bit sad that we have to point this out still to these people. But uh, you know, point it out, we will continue to do. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Councillor Waters. Thank you, Chair. Um, that's very interesting that... Councillor Smith has just read out, and I hope that it will be taken on board by National Highways because um, the waste of money that all these trees have, have died is, is cruel and, and wicked. Because when the idea of the upgrade to the A14 was suggested many years ago, it was one of the first concerns of residents, particularly in Bar Hill, about the removal of so many trees along that stretch which I was, I believe, about 16 miles, and they were such good buffers for noise, and trees are such value to birds and wildlife and the whole eco-environment. We were assured in Bar Hill that there would be replanting of trees, and I have kept reassuring residents of that over the years. And I do agree with Councillor Ellington, it is a shambles replacing the trees with whips and letting them die. And not only just once, but continually doing it. I've seen them replanting so many times. But what advice would have been taken by uh, National Highways? As Councillor Smith just said, we've just had a really good explanation of what should have been done. And it really is not good enough that National Highways have just gone off and done exactly as they like. So i'm sure that everybody's going to support this motion and i and that we all accept it and thank you very much thank you councillor waters so councillor ellington would you like to sum up before we go to the vote thank you i think it is gratifying to hear that others feel quite as strongly as i do 
I really feel that um, we talk a lot about eco-friendliness. We look at um, the greenery and the trees and so on that were there. They were absorbing carbons. They were getting, reducing the amount of sound that was from the road. All of those things, apart from um, all the wildlife and so on, which were displaced. I am very pleased to hear that uh, members are as worried as I am about what we're doing to our countryside. And I uh, would urge you all to vote for this and take the necessary action. Thank you. Thank you, members. So um, at that point, let's go to the vote then. Uh, so this is uh, on Councillor Ellington's motion 14B. If, could I ask the webcasting, webcasting officer to conduct an electronic vote? Oh, no, sorry. I think we're all in, in agreement on this, aren't we? I think we're all in... It, it, so can we take this by affirmation? Oh, sorry. Okay, let's vote anyway, if it's there. Okay. Erin has stopped it. So can I just take then this by affirmation? I'm sorry, it's my mistake. Nobody's, re nobody's called for a recorded vote, have they? No. no. Let's do it by affirmation, folks. So, agreed. agreed. Thank you. Are there any ag against or any abstentions? No. So that's unanimous. Thank you very much, members. And I, I apologise for, for causing the confusion. Uh, are we happy to carry on? Um, do you need a break for five minutes, folks? Yes, okay. Can I ask we take a, a, a let's give it a 10 minute break um, until 22, five, and then we'll proceed with um, 14C.
Erin. Thank you, members. Thank you. Uh, after that short break, we'll move on now to item 14C, which is the motion from Councillor Alex Mallion. So, Councillor Mallion, would you like to move your motion? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I'm very pleased to propose this motion to Council today. Um, my ward colleague, Councillor Chung Johnson, is unfortunately unable to be here today to second the motion as intended, as she's currently isolating, but thanks to Councillor Ian Solemn for agreeing to second in her absence. Councillor Chung Johnson and I both feel extremely privileged to have represented the residents of Norstow for the last five years. Uh, four years, apologies. <laughs> Getting ahead of myself. Um, during that time, we've seen Norstow grow from just a few residents to become an active and thriving community with over 1,000 homes and numerous community groups and events, and now their own town council. Last week, I was able to attend the first annual town meeting of Norstow electors, and this year, as a community, they will celebrate the fifth anniversary of the first residents moving into Norstow. It therefore feels like a very appropriate time for us as a council to reaffirm our commitment to Norstow. South Cams has played a central role in Norstow's development to this point, and we are extremely grateful to officers for their commitment to, to supporting exemplary community development. We as a council will now take a direct role in bringing forward vital community buildings, the Enterprise Zone and Civic Hub. It is essential that we work closely with the community and Norstow Town Council to develop community facilities that meet the current needs, but also the future aspirations of this vibrant new town. This includes exploring, as any responsible organisation delivering complex projects of this kind would do, any necessary contingencies that might be required. I therefore urge this council to support this motion, reaffirming our commitments to the wonderful community of Northstone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Mallion. And do you have a second? You have a seconder. Councillor Solomon, do you want to reserve your right to speak or speak now? I reserve. Okay, thank you. Councillor Handley. Thank you, Chair. Um, as uh, Councillor Mallion has already said, um, since the first residents moved into Norstow around about five years ago, um, it's become a, a thriving community and is going from strength to strength. And we're very proud of the role that we've played, um, the council has played, uh, in helping the community to evolve. Uh, we now have two full-time community development officers who are supporting the community's aspirations and they've helped numerous groups to set up and grow uh, to ensure that people have good access to social and recreational activities, which has been a great benefit to their health and well-being. Um, we've helped to run the community wing since 2017, uh, which has provided a fantastic interim space for the community to meet and socialise and later on in this agenda uh, today we will be considering uh, an acquisition to provide uh, further interim facilities uh, until permanent ones are in place. So um, I fully support this motion. Thank you Councillor Handley. Uh, I believe Councillor Sue Ellington you'd like to speak? That was like this before I'd planned it. Right. Well, much as I love Norstow, being only about three miles away from it, and think that uh, it will develop into a really nice um, town, I really do hope that somebody very soon works out where the sewage is going, and that they make it so that it doesn't all end up in Swavesea and Fendrayton, which is the most likely thing that's going to happen. So I have to say, that I love the idea of having a thriving community, but there is so much more this council could do to sort out the effluent and the Anglia Waters approach to uh, dealing with it that I feel I might have to abstain. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ellington. Uh, would anybody else like to speak? Because if nobody else would, uh, Councillor Goff, go ahead. Yes, um, thank you. I, I'm very happy to support um, this motion and express our um, support and commitment to, to North Stoke. Um, this is a really important uh, community and it's really important that it 
it thrives. Um, and, and it's also you know, going to be um, a model for, for, for other uh, communities which we are uh, establishing in, in South Cambridgeshire too as well. So there's a lot at stake in North Stowe and uh, we, we need to uh, um, make sure that that, uh, that commitment is translated to um, the sort of facilities and the, uh, the thriving community which we all hope it will be. Um, many of my residents are already uh, looking, we're, we're close, uh, Rampton is very close to, uh, to North Stowe uh, and is beginning to look to North Stowe. Many children from Rampton are starting to go to school uh, in North Stowe, so the, the, the interaction of North Stowe is not just within the bounds of North Stowe, it's also within uh, communities which are adjacent. So um, it is really important that this, uh, this works and uh, very happy to make that uh, commitment and support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor, thank you, Councillor Goff. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. And uh, just reading through the motion, and particularly the words reaffirms its commitment, um, there's nothing in this, this motion that I, I don't support, and I agree that it should be a sustainable and welcoming and have all the facilities that you would expect from a new town. Um, I think it's a shame that we're having to reaffirm, because that infers perhaps that things haven't been going as well as they should have. Um, and... Uh, so it's a shame that this is necessary if it is to, to get things moving, but if, if that's what it takes, then I will support it. And I think particularly with North Stowe, um, when it was first mooted, there was a lot of work to having communities involved. And I think that there has been attempts to continue that. And I think that needs to continue further. Um, we've already had you know, a lot of issues. Those of us that sit on planning, you know, we've seen the, the real upset, one of the phases caused for the residents of Rampton Drift, you know, and the assurances they were given. So anything that the council can do to try and repair those relationships, I think, should be supported. Um, I would really stress on the communicating and consultation with residents. I think that's really important because we don't want another table tennis incident. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Uh, right. Over to you, Councillor Solomon, as a seconder. Thank you, Chair. Um, just Solomon, yes. I said Councillor Solomon, didn't I? I, I thought you said Councillor Solomon. Yes. Councillor yes. Solomon, would you like to speak? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, second the motion, um, although uh, unfortunately in the circumstances of Councillor Chung Johnson not being available to, today because of uh, COVID um, and isolating. Um, the motion does recognise and thank the officers, which is absolutely right. That's what the council should do. As uh, the sort of substitute seconder, I, I will take the opportunity actually to, to also thank members for their contributions to making North Stow a success and particularly the local members, uh, Councillor Mallion and Councillor Chung Johnson, and uh, Councillor Cruz Thompson is, is also uh, a great credit to the, the communities they, they represent. Whenever I visit North, though, and I don't know if other people have felt this, I'm always struck by the, the energy actually for the community that residents um, show. Um, I mean, even today, actually, there's an article in the uh, Cambridge Independent about the inaugural North Stowe Half Marathon that takes place next month, which is an uh, e exciting uh, way to celebrate this uh, five-year five anniversary of people uh, moving in for the first time. And uh, certainly the local members really reflect that energy um, in the community. And... That, that's really where I, I, I believe this, this motion comes from, the point of, 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 of the drive to make success of it. I hear what uh, Councillor Williams said in terms of, do, do we need to reaffirm this? Well, you know, I think it's particularly important to recognise milestones in all our communities. But for, for new communities, it, it, it's important as they grow to, to take pause, take a step back and recognise, with so much going on, you know, what are the really important things that we need to we need to focus on? 
and particularly those facilities that really make a, a community, as you mentioned at the end there, GP services, community space, a convenience store. It, it's worth it's worth sharing that with the community that we we know that those those things are important. So I I don't think it's a, a case that uh, we need to do this to get things moving. It's just a, an important milestone to recognise. So I I'm very happy to second this motion. I do hope that everyone will be able to back it. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Dr. Ian Solomon. Councillor Mallion, would you like to sum up? As proposal. Um, very briefly, I would just like to um, echo what um, Councillor Solomon has said. Our, our reaffirmation of our commitment to North Stowe is really just about recognising that we are at a really key point for the community as we come to five years. The community has really um, grown in numbers. As I say, they now have their own town council. They were established as a town a year ago. And we're also moving into a very key phase for the development as we bring forward these really key and important community buildings like the Civic Club and the Enterprise Zone, which we are now um, taking forward as a district council, which we're, um, the plans for that we're really excited about. So um, I, I hope that as a council, you'll be able to support this motion today and to really show our commitment to, uh, to North Stowe, which is such an important development within our district. Thank you, Councillor Mullion. I haven't heard any indication of anybody wishing to do other than support this. So can we take this by affirmation, members? Agreed. Does anybody wish to object or abstain? No. Oh, oh. sorry, Councillor Ellington. So affirmation with the exception of Councillor Ellington, who wishes to abstain. Thank you, members. So that is carried. Uh, we move on then, members, to uh, Chair's Engagements, which is on um, V1 of our agenda, page V1. I just wanted to um, draw your attention to the Chair's Engagements and add to um, the list a couple of other things. I mentioned it earlier, that on the 11th of March, I, as part of the Queen's Green Canopy uh, project, um, and in honour of Her Majesty, I planted a tree, it was in a place of my choosing um, on behalf of the District Council and I chose to do that in Fenditon on District Council land uh, at Musgrave Way and um, so that was a great pleasure to me. Um, we then had the Fenland District Council's Chairman's reception on the 18th of March but then also on the 21st of March I was delighted to be invited to the unveiling of a blue plaque at the Institute of Astronomy, uh, which was in honour of Sir Fred Hoyle, um, who was the inventor of the phrase Big Bang, whilst uh, also holding other theories in his mind. Um, and we went to a very happy celebration with his granddaughter and great-grandchildren. So that was uh, a very happy event. Um, and for myself, I'd just like to say how much I've enjoyed being chair of the, par of the parish, of the county, of the district council. I'll get the right one in a minute. <laughs> of the district council. And thank you for the honour that you've given me in, in, in fulfilling that role. Thank you. Very kind. Thank you. Moving on now, uh, we come to exclusion of the press and public members. Uh, I propose that we must now consider whether to exclude the press and public from the meeting during consideration of the next item for the reasons stated on the agenda. So I propose that the press and public be excluded from the meeting during consideration of the following item number 17 in accordance with section 100 brackets A brackets 4 of the Local Government Act 1972 on the grounds that if present, there would be disclosure to them of exempt information as defined in paragraph 3 of part 1 of schedule 12A of the Act as amended. So, can I have a seconder for that? Councillor Fain, thank you very much. Uh, so, members, are you content to take this decision by affirmation? Would anybody wish to object or abstain? Thank you, members. So, that's carried by affirmation. 
So, Bridget, wish, did you wish to speak? Sorry, I'm going to ask, are there any members of the press or public present in the chamber? And if so, Okay, um, any members of the press or public who are in the chamber should now, um, thank you for attending, but we would ask you to depart, and that's also from the webcast. We'll be stopping the webcast shortly. So, with the webcasting officer, please switch off the live stream and recording. Can I just thank everybody who's taken part online? Um, it's good that you've taken part, and thank you for attending. So, with the webcasting officer, please switch off the live stream and recording and ensure that any members of the public have left the Teams meeting. Thank you.